No other continent burns so dramatically as Australia. Some fires consume millions of acres. But within hours, currawongs are poking through the ashes. And crimson rosellas that survived the inferno are feasting on roasted eucalypt seeds. Just a few days later, eucalypts are sending out green shoots. Within a few years, the forests recover. And there's plenty of food. So it's time for crimson rosellas to start breeding again. With their bright plumage, parrots seem to be screaming out to potential predators, free food, come and get it. But whether you're a budgie, an eclectus, a rosella, or just about any other parrot, you have to take colorful risks in the mating game. Sometimes you can have the best of both worlds. These gaudy birds are in fact safely camouflaged by their leaf-like shape and green backs. Although they haven't quite mastered a disguise for the Australian suburbs. Ever since Australians started planting native trees in their cities, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. And parrots happily accept the invitation. Some overstay their welcome. With too much time on its hands, this cockatoo pokes around an electric insulator. while the maniacal corella will attack everything in its path, even tarmac. And then, the neighbor's lawn. But such destructiveness is minor compared with what they do to farmers. And cockatoos take full advantage of modern agriculture. A generation ago, Lakeland was open to intensive farming. It was ideal country for maize and peanuts. And as the crops grew, the sulfur-crested cockatoos moved in. In just a week, the birds can inflict tens of thousands of dollars damage to the maze of farmer Darren Hoskins. Susie! The numbers have bred up over the years. Main reason for that is, it's in their natural habitat. They haven't got a good amount of food all year round. We're in the valley here in Lakeland, even in the driest part of the year in August, September, when it's extremely dry, there's still crop residue on the ground, and the birds have got to feed all year round. With that, they can continue to breed 12 months a year, no problems at all. There's food and there's water here on hand, so they've got it laid on. I think it's terrific. When they're finished with the maize, the cockies head for the peanut fields, where they pick apart the hay bales. Red-tailed black cockatoos join in the fun.
So how does the farmer try to control them? Basically just driving around and shooting at them with a high-powered rifle. Just the noise alone is enough to scare them or even tooting the horn. But it's a full-time job for two to three months of the year, non-stop. Basically all you're doing is just driving around following the cockatoos from one paddock to another until the day warms up. It gets too warm for them so they go back and roost in the trees and they come back again and commence their feeding. And then we commence to chase them again, which is bloody annoying. Farther south, in the wheat country, it's a different cockatoo, but it's the same story. In small doses, little corellas are a delightful and entertaining bird. But when flocks of up to 30,000 marauding birds descend on your harvest, you can understand why a farmer might be a little upset. The grain is stored in giant bunkers and protected by thick canvas. But the canvas is no match for their sharp beaks. And having feasted on the main course, it's off to the nearest vineyard for a little dessert. For lychee farmers, rainbow lorikeets are the enemy. The farmers spend every daylight hour patrolling their orchard to keep the birds at bay. Like children with cupcakes, they take a bite from each one, spoiling them for everybody else. For the farmer, it's a race to see who gets to the ripest fruit first. And the birds are winning. But not all farmers are at war with parrots. A Queensland cattle station has become an unlikely refuge for a rare turquoise beauty. The golden-shouldered parrot. Last century, bird fanciers trapped these prized parrots and robbed their nests. This plunder left the species hanging on by a thread. To make matters worse, these picky parrots have very particular lifestyle requirements. For starters, a breeding couple needs an air-conditioned termite mound to burrow into and make a nest. They've made Sue Shepherd's cattle property home. And every breeding season for 30 years, she's been riding hundreds of miles, checking every mound for chicks. In half the occupied mounds, Sue has found the nest floor covered with a grub that is unique to the nests of golden-shouldered parrots. The grub belongs to a moth that synchronizes the hatching of her babies with that of the chicks. The grubs eat the chicks' poo, which seems to suit everyone. Meanwhile, the chick's parents go out looking for food together. When they return, Dad flies to the mound to check that all is safe. And to let the young ones know that it's mealtime. 
He stands guard while the female comes down to feed the chicks. An exhausting schedule when your chicks need four or five meals a day. Dad's job is to coax the five-week-old chicks out of their cozy nest and into the big, bad world. It's the dry season, which means it's hard for the young birds to find food in the thick grass. So Sue helps nature along, burning the bush and exposing the next meal. Sue's property is a haven for the golden-shouldered parrot and her efforts may be the only thing standing between them and extinction. Even farther north, in the remote woodlands of Cape York Peninsula, there's a parrot that's intrigued scientists for a century. Steve Murphy came here as a young biologist 10 years ago. His quest was to unlock the secrets of the world's most spectacular cockatoo, the palm cockatoo. Few people have ever seen this bird. Look here, here he comes. The palm cockatoo dates back tens of millions of years to when Australia was covered in rainforest. He's the granddaddy of them all. Little was known of this mysterious bird until Steve Murphy began his study. And the only way to find them in this rainforest is to mimic their calls. They've got a huge repertoire of calls that they use in display. The hello call they make is, is part of the display. It seems to be made almost as if they're saying hello to their, their, their partner or their, their neighbouring cockatoos. Unlike other cockatoos, palm cockatoos don't live in flocks. They pair up with a mate and seem to stick with them for life. And they can live for up to 90 years. One cockatoo in captivity had her first chick at 54. But to get the girl, the male must be a man of property with a portfolio of good nesting hollows. And if he wants any chance of mating, she must be persuaded that he's strong enough to build her several magnificent nests. All the elements of a palm cockatoo display are designed to draw attention to that massive beak. The blushing of the cheek patch, the wing spreading, which makes them bigger. It's all designed to show other cockatoos that they're strong, and the pinnacle of their strength is in their beak. Essentially, he is trying to prove that he is a blue chip investment, and that she can feel comfortable putting all her eggs in his basket.
they join up every morning and afternoon at these nest hollows. And they catch up on the day's events and it really does sound like you're, you're listening to a, an old married couple sometimes. I mean, the analogy continues. It's just like humans and the pride that humans have in their houses. Palm cockatoos are exactly the same. But the most amazing display of all is when males bring back to the nest a small stick and they actually drum on the side of the nest. Maybe it's because palm cockatoos live so long that they have time to learn so much. But it's a rare thing anywhere in the animal world to see a tool being used quite this deliberately. I think it's very likely that the female watches these drumming displays and can tell something about either the male or the nest tree at which he's performing. You know, there's something that she's picking up in the way that the drumming sound resonates inside the hollow. We don't really know, but, I mean, she watches very intently. The choosy males will try two or three different drumsticks before they settle on one they really like. When they actually perform the drumming display at the nest, it does seem to have a rhythm. But when he's finished with it, He'll often sit at the edge of the hollow and splinter up the stick and add it to the nesting platform that's inside the hollow. If the female is impressed, she will walk down and join him at the entrance of the nest to see if it's good enough to breed in. With the hollow approved, they can fly off to have a morning snack. The local birds gather at trees that are fruiting. That really powerful beak that palm cockatoos have, which is by far the biggest beak of any of the cockatoos, it allows them to eat foods that other cockatoos and other animals in general just simply can't access. I think palm cockatoos are very intelligent. You've only got to watch a pair courting at their nest or, or a male fashioning a drumstick to realise that there is complicated thought going in that, that big head of theirs. Of course, these regal palm cockatoos are not the only clever ones. All parrots are smart. But these are the oldest, the closest living relatives of the ancestral cockatoos that first evolved in Australia some 20 million years ago. From these northern tropical rainforests, parrots began winging their way all across the continent, adapting to every corner of the country. There's no greater richness and diversity of parrots anywhere than here, in Australia, the land of Oz.